Hi everyone, this is Christina Hill again. This HISPM 711 Power of Three video will focus on Jon Snow and his impact on the field of public health. Snow was a physician who practiced in London from the late 1830s until his death of a stroke at the age of 45. He was a pioneer in the field of anesthesia, but he is most famous for his work in identifying the source of a cholera outbreak in 1854, thus determining that cholera is a waterborne disease. London in the 1850s was the largest city on the planet, and in fact it was the largest city in history up to that point in terms of population. It was also a highly unsanitary place to live. Livestock were often kept in homes, and sewage management systems often consisted of open cesspools in the basement. Outbreaks of disease were quite common, and cholera was one of the most deadly. Every few years, it would kill several thousand people in the course of a few days. Experts in the then-fledgling field of public health became convinced that bad airs, called miasmas, were the source and carrier of cholera. The city administration passed the New Citizens Removal Act of 1848, mandating that citizens empty out their cesspools and dispose of their waste in the river to eliminate these bad airs. Unfortunately, this measure increased cholera incidence as it is a waterborne disease rather than decreasing it. John Snow was a practicing physician at the time of a particularly virulent outbreak in a neighborhood near Broad Street in 1854. One sick child's waste had been dumped into a cesspool that was near to the Broad Street pump and was leaking into the well water. Snow had argued for some time that cholera was waterborne rather than airborne, but had not convinced the medical community. He teamed up with a minister named Henry Whitehead and determined through door-to-door -door interviews that households stricken by cholera all shared in common the Broad Street pump as their source of drinking water. Snow created a map to document the number of deaths at each residence, demonstrating visually the source of the outbreak at the pump. When Snow presented his information to the parish officials, the handle of the pump was removed to keep people from obtaining water at that source. This halted the outbreak and prevented further cholera infection from that pump. Unfortunately, after the outbreak subsided, the officials replaced the handle of the pump and rejected Snow's conclusions, sticking to their theory of airborne cholera. However, Snow's ideas were disseminated and slowly began to make an impact on public health practices. The last really debilitating outbreak of cholera in London was in 1866, according to Stephen Johnson. City officials responded to the outbreak by telling everyone to boil their water, and the outbreak ceased. Jon Snow had by that time been deceased almost a decade, but the world looks back on his work as the first real touchstone of epidemiological research. It may be hard to imagine today, when the majority of the world's population lives in large cities, but Snow helped to chisel away at the, the idea that growth of cities the size of London was unsustainable. Perhaps most importantly, he demonstrated that humans can solve seemingly unsurmountable public health problems through reason and logic. The article by Koch and Denneke assigned for today's class reading argues that Snow could have been more convincing to his critics and that his theory of waterborne infection of cholera would have been accepted earlier had he used a comparison of the relative risk ratios or mortality per 1,000 persons in the Broad Street area versus other nearby areas rather than relying on the crude rates he used in his map. Do you agree with the authors? If so, why or why not? Thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed today's class discussion. Hello, everyone. I am Doel Jabri, and I'll talk to you today about the significant work of Goldberger and Seidenstreicher in the field of public health. Goldberger, a physician and epidemiologist, and Seidenstreicher, a public health statistician and economist, were pioneer scientists who have significant contribution to the development of social epidemiology. They were also advocates for scientific and social recognition of the links between poverty and disease. Their work together started in 1914 when they were assigned to an investigation of pellagra in the south of the United States. Between 1900 and 1940, the pellagra killed at least 100,000 individuals. Goldberger's theory that pellagra was associated with diet and poverty contradicted the commonly held opinion that pellagra was an infectious disease. Although half of these pellagra victims were African-American, 
and more than two-thirds were women, contemporary observers paid little attention to these gender and racial differences in their analysis of disease. Goldberger and Seidenstreicher were the first to detect social determinants and link between health, poverty, and diet. They argued that Pellagra was deeply rooted in the political economy of cotton monoculture in the South, especially that the dramatic drop in cotton prices in 1920 and decrease in the income of many Southerners caused a spike in the number of reported Pellagra cases. They also found a significant correlation between the rise and fall in the price of animal protein foods and the disease's onset and remission. To prove this hypothesis, Goldberger tried to prevent and cure the disease with a dietary intervention in two orphanages that have high rates of endemic plagra. He kept the sanitary conditions unchanged during the study to exclude bias and arranged for two groups of ill and healthy children to receive a new, more varied diet. Results showed no new cases of pellagra occurred and almost all children with pellagra were cured. Goldberger then repeated the study in a mental asylum, using both a treatment and a control group followed up for one year. Of 72 patients with pellagra, all were cured after the introduction of the new diet. Critics were still hassling Goldberger that pellagra was an infectious disease, not a dietary disorder, which made him angry and frustrated. He hoped that one final dramatic experiment would convince his critics. On April 1916, he injected 5 cubic centimeters of a pellagran blood into the arm of his assistant, Dr. George Wheeler. Wheeler shot 6 centimeters of such blood into Goldberger. Then they swabbed out the secretions of a pellagran's nose and throat and dropped them into their own noses and throats. They swallowed capsules containing scabs of pellagran's rashes. Others joined what Goldberger called his filth parties, including his wife, and none of the volunteers got pellagra. Despite Goldberger's heroic efforts, few physicians remained staunch opponents of the dietary theory. For Goldberger's final work, he abandoned the epidemiologic method, believing that it had confirmed his original hypothesis and had reached the limits of its own potential. Goldberger and his colleagues moved from community observation to clinical experiment, producing excellent examples of both public health research and clinical investigation. The most striking aspect of Goldberger and Seidenstreicher work was its flexibility and sensitivity to social and economic context. Seidenstreicher introduced a systematic way of thinking about diseases, their social distribution and the methods to study them, and the implications for health policy. He pioneered rigorous survey methods not only in the United States, but subsequently for the League of Nations. Goldberger, in himself and in his career, personifies the emergence of epidemiology as a discipline built on its own logic from data founded on observation, experiment, and evidence-based action at the population level. In the scale and complexity of Goldberger's and Seidenstreicher's work, in their dependence on team techniques and interdisciplinary studies, they were forerunners of a new idiom in the social approach to disease and built the roots of social and clinical epidemiology in the 20th century. Finally, here's a question for discussion. How do you think social determinants in health have shaped our today's research? Do you think that improving the social determinants of the countries in Rosling bottom left corner will significantly improve their situation? This Power of Three video by Emily Zimmerman is on the evolution of medicine through the contributions of three 19th century scientists, Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, and Joseph Lister. The impact of their findings and innovations propelled medicine into a new era of life-saving techniques. This video will explore the history of science, medicine, and modern thought that created the foundations for these dramatic contributions, as well as the implications of their work. Before the mid-19th century, medical care was a rather hit or miss affair. Some medical practices helped patients, while some were downright harmful. Why? 
Medical science lacked an adequate theory of infectious disease, which was no trivial matter as infectious diseases were the primary cause of mortality. There were several competing theories. Miasma theory held that disease was caused by a poisonous vapor with suspended particles of decaying matter characterized by a foul smell. Although this theory may have contributed to well-being by promoting new sanitary measures, it did not create a useful therapeutic approach for medicine. Contagion theory recognized the spread of disease through seeds, more akin to inert chemicals than microorganisms. Of course, concepts of morality and divine intervention remained important interpretations of disease, but overall a naturalistic approach to disease and treatment predominated in medicine in the 19th century. In addition to naturalistic ideas about health and disease, tools for investigating the human and natural environment were a necessary precursor to advancement. As the stethoscope allowed for a view of physiological functioning from the inside, starting in 1816, the microscope was a necessary precursor to germ theory. But, oops, McNeil states that in the 1880s, the microscope abruptly reversed the balance of medical opinion. In fact, a relatively powerful microscope was invented in the Netherlands in the 17th century, making possible the observation of microorganisms by about 1700. Bacteria were even observed in the blood of infected animals years before Pasteur's experiments, but they were thought to be the result of disease rather than the cause. The leap forward that capitalized on naturalistic theories of disease and new methods of empirical observation and analysis was dependent upon careful experimentation. In the mid-19th century, Louis Pasteur, a French chemist, went beyond observation to hypothesize that microbes caused spoilage in wine, beer, and milk, conducted groundbreaking experiments, and developed pasteurization to kill microorganisms. Pasteur disproved the theory of spontaneous generation and linked microbes to the development of disease. Soon after, Dr. Robert Koch built on the work of Pasteur and identified the microbes responsible for TB and cholera. He developed Koch's postulates for linking particular microbes to particular diseases. The new germ theory of disease led to a revolution in medicine, including vaccinations and the introduction of antiseptic surgery by English surgeon Joseph Lister, opening the way for safer surgery and the development of a new arsenal of surgical techniques. These innovations, based in rational inquiry and empirical evidence, provided a new basis for medical authority and competence to help bring medicine and its practice into a new era. Pasteur, Koch, and Lister were all European. What characteristics of European science and medicine created conditions for experimentation that were not as prevalent in America at the time? 